Uh, moving right along, our next thing on our agenda, I'm going to shorten my introduction, uh, and quite honestly, as cliche as it may sound, uh, Professor Eugene H. Spafford, universally known as SPAF, needs very little introduction. Uh, he is the founder of Sirius, first forming the Coast Laboratory in 1992, uh, which grew into Sirius and served as our director until just a few years ago. He's fresh off of one year ago after his sabbatical, and we're glad to have him back on campus. And he is going to uh, host a fireside chat with our two um, uh, very successful uh, cybersecurity leaders. Spath, I'll allow you to do the introductions of our speakers. Thank you, Joel. And let's see, am I live here yet? Yes, we can see you, Spath. All right, excellent. Um, so uh, we have a tradition here at the uh, symposium of uh, every year having a few keynotes to provide some interesting insights from different uh, sectors of the community. And every year we're kind of search for good suggestions. Uh, this year we had somebody suggest, well, we know you get people from industry, senior, senior people from industry and senior people from government. I've got a great idea um, for two people to bring up to the panel. And uh, there are some other interesting aspects to having these two. Uh, and when we did a little bit of research, we were, we were blown away at the possibility um, and thankfully both of these individuals have agreed to appear. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go into a, a lot of depth here. I'm going to ask them to do a little self-introduction. But we have uh, Julian Galina, who's the Chief Information Officer at the Central Intelligence Agency. And she has a career that's uh, had many interesting twists to get to this point. Um, and we have Chris Lovejoy, who's uh, Ernst & Young's global consulting cybersecurity leader, uh, who also has had an interesting path to get where she is. Now, you'll hear a little bit from them uh, about their backgrounds, but um, the thing that was most interesting to us as we started researching is these two incredibly accomplished people are sisters. Uh, so we have a, an element of uh, exceptional uh, interest and capability implied in cybersecurity that seems to have uh, a family component. Uh, and so we are just overjoyed to have um, Chris and Julie here to uh, speak today. So I want to start and ask, um, why don't we start with uh, 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 Julie there and, and just tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are and what your, your job currently entails. Hi, Spaff. Thanks for having me here today with my sister, Kristen. It's just an absolute pleasure. And I, I want to uh, thank Purdue University and the Sirius Symposium for having us both. I, I really appreciate it. So you, you've asked about uh, how I got to where I am. The, the short story is I signed up for the Navy when I was 17, did that for a while. Then I jumped and went to the CIA. Then I jumped from that, went to industry, and then came back to the CIA most recently in uh, 2019, last spring, to be the CIO. So that's the, that's the short story. Um, but the, you're right, there were twists and turns there. And a lot of those decisions I, I look back on about when I was making those big pivots in my career. And I think for the most part, it was never with a mind to become a CIO or to even be focused on cybersecurity as my, as my major, but it, it just kind of happened. Um, and I think I'm a product of my time in the sense that when I look back at the, um, the, the backdrop of history and what was happening in my community, the community I joined in the Navy initially, which was cryptology or information warfare, I joined to be a linguist and hoped to lead men and women um, in the sea service on ships, aircraft, and so on to do the intercept of um, adversary communications, essentially. That was the purpose. And if you think back to the, the, the transition between the decade of the 80s to the 90s, we were just getting the internet and people were beginning to network things. And so what used to be a very intimate affair of trying to get up close so you could intercept a signal all of a sudden became 
enabled by antenna that could be placed very far away from where the people were. And we could begin to use things like this crazy new thing, the internet, to network and, um, and operate remotely. And that's when uh, all of a sudden my profession of information warfare or information operations became cyber as well. Um, and cyber operations began essentially as a profession in the Navy at the same time. So that was sort of the roots of it. And uh, it, it happened by accident. I found that the Navy decided that they were gonna decrease the number of people doing language languages to listen to foreign communications and actually move more into the intercept of machine generated signals. And that's when I decided to go into space systems engineering and electrical engineering. Um, so that's kind of the genesis of how, how I, I got here, even though it wasn't my original choice of major or anything like that. That's, that's a great story and, and one that I can identify with because my path similarly didn't start out uh, to go in this direction. I think uh, many people who have gotten some seniority in the field started other places and got here. Um, Chris, could, could you sort of introduce how you got to where you are and, and what you do? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I want to echo what my sister said. Bob. Thank you so much for having us both here. Um, it's, it's really an honor for us. Um, and for those of you who are listening in, um, yeah, I just want to say you are so incredibly lucky to be um, associated with this institution and SPOF in general. I, I remember, you know, I was saying to my sister, um, because she's saying, how do, how do you know SPOF? I said, well, I think it was like 25 years ago, I was reading papers that you used, you were writing with Dorothy Denning. And so for me, my heroes in this particular space were you and Dorothy. So I just want to say, I'm just incredibly honored to be here. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so from a, you know, a background perspective, you know, I have the most um, unusual path to, um, you know, information security, I think, you know, that one could describe, you know, from a, when I graduated from high school and I went to college, I studied um, English and international affairs. Never, ever, ever, ever did I dream I would be in this field. Um, you know, and it was just a set of happy accidents um, that led me here. Um, I was uh, for quite a while um, in uh, Camp Lejeune in North Carolina uh, with my husband at the time who was a, a pilot at the Marine Corps um, Air Station there. And you know, during the time, I didn't really have a lot that I was doing um, other than volunteering. And you know, it was when I was volunteering that I, you know, sort of recognized the power of sort of computer technology for communications. And so this was back, you know, this is almost 30 years ago now. Um, and you know, at the time, I was using um, you know computer technology just for you know developing newsletters and that sort of thing. And I was running a program to help the spouses of deployed Marines, and I realized that they were really suffering when the guys were away, and they needed some way to communicate um, with their um, with their spouses while they were away. And so I decided, hey, this computer thing, I've been reading about this internet thing, you know, perhaps what we can do is we can, you know, raise some money, buy some computers, and magically allow the spouses to communicate with their husbands on the ship. Little did I know it didn't actually work that way. I, I raised the money, bought the computers, and learned that, you know, remote networking, actually you have to do some configuration and there has to be somebody that picks up on the other end. Suffice to say, I became kind of the cottage expert on remote communications in North Carolina just by virtue of, you know, sheer trying it out, trying to figure out how these things worked, how they uh, connected together. Um, and when we transferred to DC, I took those skills and um, I was, I, I got a job as a network engineer at the time um, because the, you really didn't need a lot of uh, qualifications uh, because there were very few people who really understood how, you know, things connect together. Um, and I ended up at a contract with, at one of the intel agencies and, and it was there that I felt, I realized I had quite an acumen um, for this particular field, networking in particular. Um, received, you know, a number of qualifications as part of that. Um, happened to be taught the basics of uh, penetration testing, and then took that and went on um, to have, you know, lots of different fantastic experiences. 
I, you know, went from being a pen tester to helping start and sell a couple of companies um, and to, into the industry, one of which was a company that we sold to IBM. When I got to IBM, I was the chief security officer and um, had an opportunity to leave IBM, start another company, sold that, and joined uh, EY about a year ago. I think you know the common thing you know for me in all of that time is that I, you know I have you know had an opportunity to see a an industry um, grow as well as in many ways uh, stay the same, <laughs> um, and uh, have had an opportunity to take a lot of my earlier education in fields like you know just writing and arbitration and apply that to this more complex technology-based field. And so it's been very interesting to see, you know, how all of these things are, you know, kind of merging together now. That's great. Well, I think one of the things that our listeners and particularly the students should take away from uh, both of these background discussions uh, is don't assume that everything that's going to guide what you do is, is learning how to uh, make computers do what you want them to. Uh, having other skills, uh, learning things outside your area of primary expertise can often lead to greater opportunities. And I think both of you are examples of this, uh, where you build on things you knew and were eager to learn new things as you went along. That, that, that's a common theme in both your stories. Mm -hmm. and, and it's really one that uh, students and professionals in the field would be well advised to heed. Well, I've got a, a couple questions to kick off here to ask each of you to, to uh, comment on. Um, and I'll tell the audience that if you want to add some questions to the list that I have, please post them in the Slack channel that is set up for this keynote. And I will get to them uh, at some point, hopefully in the discussion. But the first question I'd like to ask both of you is, uh, we've really had a disruption of business as usual over the last few months because of uh, COVID-19, because of changes in work habits. Um, some employees have fallen ill, unfortunately, uh, severely ill in some cases and unable to resume to work. Uh, organizations have laid people off, including in IT staff. Um, and not only has this been disruptive, but there are indications it is going to continue for many months uh, until a, a good vaccine is widely available. Plus, we're about to head into flu season, so it may even get worse. What have you seen as the, the takeaways from this? Not necessarily just the challenges, but things that organizations uh, should be doing to uh, sort of lean forward and, and make their IT security practices better. So whichever of you'd like to take that on first. Jill, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I, I want to acknowledge some of the, the gravity of the situation. As Faf, you mentioned it, people have lost their, their livelihoods, their concern for their family. Some have even lost loved ones or friends. And it's, it is a serious disease. And we have to always, as leaders, be thinking about how to keep our families and our workforce safe. Um, so I, I just wanna, before I go in a different direction and make it a little more lighthearted, um, I just wanna acknowledge the gravity of the situation. So um, honestly, I think th this has taught me that one should never let a good crisis go to waste. This, the, um, this pandemic is making, I, I joke with my husband and I say, this is the CIO's time to shine because mm -hmm. People who previously thought IT was boring and, and um, providing desktop solutions to an enterprise might be kind of a garden variety IT. Uh, I'll tell you that it is absolutely intertwined with keeping our workforce safe and secure, and it's transforming the way people work. There's a ton of um, press on this where various enterprise leaders have moved much more quickly to have work from home solutions you can imagine for the CIA, our workforce, given the, the security, the, the secure content and the classified content that we're dealing with, 
it's a little bit um, of a variation on that theme. We don't necessarily encourage uh, our officers to be working from home with classified content. In fact, we don't at all. Um, but it, it's been a great challenge and I, I've embraced it. So I think what we're seeing, at least in the intelligence community, is a tremendous catalyst to transform the way people perceive a culture that was previously absolutely person to person. We're really, truly think about the role of the CIA within the intelligence community. It's about human intelligence. Human intelligence classically is about building a relationship first and then building trust. And so we find in our culture, our conversations, even about technology, are typically uh, expected to be in person, face to face. That's completely transformed and it's opened up a world of possibilities for me as a CIO to put different technologies in the hands of our officers. So I, I personally think it's been a, a great catalyst for us. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think just to sort of, I wanna echo, you know, many of the points um, my sister made, but, you know, I think I, I do wanna take a step back a little bit and talk about, you know, COVID is having amplified many of the sort of problems that we've had in the industry for a long time. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's most important to understand about cybersecurity and why we are where we are, meaning that we can't ever seem to get our arms around the space. We don't seem to be making the progress we should. And you ask yourself why. A lot of it is a cognitive dissonance between the cybersecurity teams and the business lines. So if you look at it statistically, um, only about 36% of new initiatives that are coming out of a business. So let's say... I want to implement new systems to enable me to manage my supply chain. Only 36% of them are gonna call the security team in from the beginning to help um, to design security inside that initiative. So what happens is the cybersecurity team is brought in after the fact with their compliance checklist. It's like trying to retrofit a seatbelt into a car that's on the highway you know, going 60 miles an hour. It's hard to do. And so therefore, if you look at COVID and what has COVID done, it, it was an overnight for existential reasons, about 80% of the world began to adopt new technology platforms, oftentimes cloud-based platforms to enable work from home, as well as to enable new ways of working with their clients. And guess what? Very few of them actually integrated security control within the context of those new platform acquisitions. So what we're seeing statistically is it's about 60% of those that adopted the new technology completely skipped over or abbreviated even the compliance check associated with the cyber, with uh, security and privacy. So as a result, what are we seeing? We're seeing an increased attack surface. We're seeing increased exposure and impact from um, these attackers who are, are recognizing you've got a lot of people that are working from home that are scared and they're willing to double click on news and items that are of interest to them and related to this, you know, this particular event. You've got a lot more vulnerable systems out there. And so again, you know, COVID has really amplified, you know, the issue that we've got in the industry that cybersecurity is an afterthought. And so, you know, I want to bring this back to kind of, you know, Spock, what you were saying about the experiences of not necessarily, you know, security being all about technology. Security is also about communication. It's about being able to communicate um, in a very sort of concise and business oriented way, the value of the investments that you're making to protect people, to protect systems. It's very important that you have those soft skills and you're able to, to translate that technology conversation into something that is of value. Now, Bringing it to the more of the specific, what does this mean for security today? I do want to echo what my sister said about there is a there is a silver lining here. You know, one of the things that happens in a uh, in a good economic time is that people will buy a lot of tools to deal with that compliance or crisis issue. And over time, what happens within a security organization is you have a lot of complexity. And you can't ever take anything out because the auditors won't let you. It just it doesn't work that way. So during COVID, what we have is an opportunity because of the financial crunch and because of this new focus on new technologies to enable new ways of working, we have an opportunity to say, stop the madness. 
to simplify and streamline our approach to ensure that our strategy is consistent and in line with the budget uh, and the strategy of the business and to better ensure that our objectives are meeting the objectives of the business as well. So all of this, I think the good news from COVID is it does give us that opportunity to step back and to become the operators of innovation and positive change for the organization and not simply the, you know, sort of the firefighters that are coming in after the fact. Right. This is something that, at least in my teaching, I've tried to convey to students. Um, I, I generally reduce it to the maximum that, that security isn't saying no, it's saying, let me show you how to do it. Exactly. In a safe way. Um, and and uh, we need to do more of that. But, but I want to build on something uh, else I, that you just mentioned. May, oh, go ahead. may I also, um, I want to elaborate on something Kristen said. I, I think um, when you think about the who Kristen and I represent today, Kristen's seeing the, the entire globe and many industries. And so the, her, her, the trend she's seeing, she's spot on. The, the um, proliferation of new solutions to help people transform the way they work is, is increasing the attack surface for any enterprise. And that's true of me too. And for, for me, you can think of me representing um, a, a typical CIO for, which is a microcosm of what Kristen is seeing. And, and I have um, two hats to wear, right? Um, I'm not only responsible for the compliance and the cybersecurity of our enterprise, but I also have a role, like many CIOs, to deliver the IT and make sure that it's working. And those two roles can often be at odds with one another. There's an inherent tension there. Um, and, I, and every CIO fights with this idea of shadow IT. What I think has really worked well in our enterprise over the past few months which gets to Kristen's point and yours also about soft skills, is that the reason why my team was able to move fast to deliver things to our enterprise in a new way is because we've been very careful in the preceding months before the pandemic to build the relationships with our cybersecurity, our security experts, and also our counterintelligence experts. And in, we do have this unique aspect of our organization where we have some insight into adversary activities through our counterintelligence counterparts. And so because we had built those relationships, I was able to move really fast and it actually outpaced some citizen IT or shadow IT in some cases where I think before the pandemic, if somebody wanted to come up with a new and innovative solution and kind of bypass the security, and kind of run, uh, run under the radar, so to speak, they could do that. But when compliance catches up with them, when I as the CIO find them, uh, then they, it's like Kristen says, you have to add the seatbelt after. We had a chance during the pandemic to move really fast, build a car with the seatbelts in it. Um, and it was because of the relationships. So absolutely true about the soft skills. That's great, that's great. And, and I hope that message is heard here. Um, I, I'd like to build on, on a theme uh, that both of you touched on, and, and it is the fact that um, too often uh, people working in security have a, a neighborhood view rather than a global view. Mm -hmm. And uh, this pandemic is global. Uh, more and more businesses have international presence. We also have international supply chains. Um, and this has been in the news more and more recently where we've had alleged attacks for uh, trying to steal vaccine information, for instance. And we have legal actions occurring to uh, try to exclude some companies from US markets because of allegations of, of uh, misbehavior of some of the products or at least of, of uh, the governments where those companies are located. Um, this, this pandemic is affecting countries in different ways because of how their governments and how their people are reacting. Uh, some don't have the resources and they're suffering massive losses. Um, others are turning this around as an opportunity perhaps. Um, you both have different views of this international uh, connection. Uh, so I think, uh, Julie, you have, you have a concern there for supply chains and there, there are some issues of of cooperation and the nature of your organization has a somewhat adversarial relationship with some countries. Um, but Chris, that's also the case for companies I think you advise is that, that companies have competitors, they have 
adversaries in other countries that are run as state interests. So um, in this environment, because we have a difficulty with attribution, we have international boundaries, we have different social norms, um, how do you see that developing? Uh, we're, we're beginning to see some balkanization, some countries that are erecting national firewalls, uh, China, or Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia. Um, are we doomed to balkanization or are there ways that we can securely cooperate with each other? I, I know that's a big question, but I wanted to give you lots of room to, uh, to, to give answers on that. Jules, do you want to start? Should I? I think she needs to think about it a little, so. <laughs> yeah, I think so, I'll defer I, to you first. Okay. <laughs> so um, the Balkan, a sort of, it, it's a great question and there, it is a, it is a multi-layered, uh, multi-layered question. Let me just sort of take a step back and, and you know, sort of ex talk about it from a very practical perspective. The balkanization, you know, is reflective, you know, from a, it's like cultural norms. Different, if you look at it from a, you know, a CISO's vantage point, you know, and you're looking at the world, what you recognize is that there are patterns that begin to emerge and it's based on sort of the, the cultural norms that are manifesting itself, you know, from a particular region or country. And certain areas are more like, for instance, in Europe, um, there is a, in Europe, there is a, a sort of a foundational understanding that privacy is a human right. And so therefore, a lot of the norms that you see expressing themselves in you know, sort of compliance requirements dictate that data is treated um, as if it is part of the human being, part of the individual. You own it. It is your right to maintain it. You have a right to be forgotten. Our cultural experience and our norms in the U.S. are very different. We don't have the right to privacy, per se. We have the right to protect pieces of our data, healthcare data, our banking um, information by law, and in, cer in certain states we have, you know, different uh, di different levels of um, privacy. But that said, there are different requirements that make it more likely that our data is going to be um, managed in a different way, exposed in a different way than it would be in Europe. Then you've got South America where the, the concern is about money laundering and fraud. And so a lot of the sort of regulatory expressions of that, you know, sort of find themselves, you know, come to be in, in that way. Now, when you're a, a CISO and you're trying to deal with this tapestry of requirements, often which are conflicting with one another, you've, you've, it, it's unbelievably complex and hard to do. So now, you know, it's back to your question, even what we're beginning to see is even more populism, even more about balkanization. And it is manifesting itself in a series of compliance dictates that force organizations to think about data and technology architecture, their network architecture, in a way that it allows them to sort of meet the requirements of that locality. Now, that creates more complexity. Complexity equals risk. And so it's, it, the interesting thing to me is that the approach that many of these nation states are taking is not decreasing risk, it's increasing risk. Because what it's doing is it's taking, it's it adding requirements atop an already unbelievably complex tapestry of requirements that are out there. I'm not exactly sure, practically speaking, how that's supposed to work. And oh, by the way, the practical reality is that you know, at the end of the day, human beings are going to be procuring services over the internet from companies, et cetera, to get a job done, to get something done. And you know what? They're gonna find a way around the rules if they need to. And so I do think that this, the approach that we're taking, this populist approach that we're taking today is going to manifest itself in a lot of problems. Um, long term, because it's not going to achieve the goals that any of these nation, nation states are hoping for. Because it is, as I said, creating this complexity, con creating this confusion, and creating a system where to get things done, you're going to have to go around. Well, um, to add to that, um, some recent figures I indicate that next year. The uh, prediction is uh, three and a half million unfilled cybersecurity positions globally. Mm -hmm. 
next year, probably the total amount of reported losses will be uh, $6 trillion in cybercrime, which is about 0.8% of the world GDP, which is just a, a frightening um, uh, growth in what's happened. I mean, it provides job security for us, but um, it, it's kind of a frightening, frightening picture going forward. Um, and one, one, let me just add one point on that. On particularly, what people don't realize is, it's just what is being reported as the tip of the spear is the tip of the iceberg, because ransomware is not a reportable incident, unless the data is exfiltrated or in certain jurisdictions where there is a it, view of the data requires disclosure, which most uh, privacy just, it dictates don't require. What that right. means is ransomware events are not being reported today. What we're seeing is about 80% of organizations have had a significant ransomware event. Only 20% of them have actually disclosed in any way, shape, or form those events. So you think about those statistics. Yeah, getting worse. Um, Julie, do you have something you'd want to add to this from your perspective? Sure, I really, um, I resonate with Kristen's observation that complexity e equals risk. And I've observed in some, um, in a strategy exchange with some corporate CIOs, it's a group I, I belong to, I had an opportunity to ask other corporate CIOs how they're approaching this diversity and compliance with their global footprint. And to, to a person, they all said they have a walled garden approach, meaning that for some countries, in China in particular, they have um, an approach where they've segmented their IT in such a way that they can um, essentially cut it off or isolate it in an, in an extreme situation, but they can also adhere to the local laws and compliance policies locally in order to continue doing business as an international corporation. And so they, they talked a lot about the complexity of that the concern that I have about um, where that might lead us is if we continue to have divergence in our technical footprint, there's an opportunity for our um, technology providers to also diverge and to essentially have a, a Betamax versus VHS kind of uh, separation. That might be too, um, too old school of a reference for the <laughs> audience here. So I'll say it's kind of like Android versus Apple uh, because essentially I can imagine a future where countries or regions are working off of different technology baselines. Mm -hmm. Now, for an organization like mine, where I seek to um, protect myself from an adversary or protect my enterprise from an adversary, I need to understand their tools. Today, we all use the same technology baselines. Um, so my defense is based on an understanding of attack vectors that are based on common usage, common patterns. If an adversary has a different technology tool set, that's a big concern to me because it doubles my homework. Not only can they use my tools against me, they can use their tools against me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's an offensive component to that as well. I'll leave that unaddressed for today. I'll leave that exercise to the student to think about, <laughs> but that increases complexity in a different way as well. So that's a concern. Another concern um, that, that, that contributes to that is about misinformation and disinformation. I, I, this, this gets a little bit more philosophical, but uh, the GDPR is a very benign example where a, a region, in that case in the EU, has for very good and benign reasons moved to protect individual privacy. Authoritarian regimes, on the other hand, are going to take a different stance. They'll view the public uh, nature of the internet and the freedom of the internet as a threat to their authoritarian regime. And they'll seek to create parity in applications, for example, where they can actually control and have some insight and dominance over the stream of information and the content. And then that would lead us into different conversations about the risk of having regions really diverging in their worldview because an authoritarian regime has either influence or control and then similarly could potentially have malign influence over our own worldview as well, without us really having the transparency and insight into how they're doing it. So um, I think that that's um, a, a little bit beyond just the cybersecurity component when you start talking about malign influence, but it's, it's very important and it's very closely linked to the idea of having two technology baselines. Mm -hmm. 
that really does address uh, part of what I was asking because where we have these international differences, um, it gets much more difficult for law enforcement, for instance, or to develop some commonality of uh, benign interest. Uh, we may see a divergence of 5G technology, for instance, or 6G, uh, and, and that is worrisome for those of us who do business or travel uh, and want to have some kind of international standardization. It, it also raises issues of problems for supply chain, uh, which are of, of concern across both business and government, because we, we don't want to have to duplicate everything. We want to buy things, but how do we have trust in them uh, to be able to employ them in our enterprises? And that becomes uh, an interesting problem. Uh, you both raised the issue of privacy, and this was something that some people in the Slack channel have also raised, and I had a, a question or two. Privacy and security are related, but they're not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, some people would argue that the reason we have uh, concern for security is to protect privacy or secrecy, which is a kind of privacy for a governmental entity or, or a commercial entity. And privacy seems to be at an earlier stage of refinement than some of our cybersecurity, and they seem to be following some of the same steps for frameworks and best practices and life cycles and other kinds of things. And it's very inconsistently applied in, in various places. Um, do, do either of you see um, us learning lessons here or of being able to use privacy as a lever to get security better? Um, I, I'm going to leave it again very general so that so that uh, you can you can pull on any thread you want there. Yeah, I, we're, I mean, I, I think that you know when it comes to privacy, you know, you look toward Europe as um, as being the stalwart in sort of the development of you know sort of very mature approaches. You know, when we're um, it's, it's interesting because my our practice in EY, we are the cybersecurity and privacy practice. It is almost inextricable to sort of to tease those two apart. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of the security controls that we put in place are to enable us to protect, you know, data. Now, that data could be personally identifiable data, which requires a certain level of, you know, security control. It could be, you know, corporate IP, trade secrets that we want to protect. You know, in Europe, uh, you know, corporate data, certain corporate data has the right of privacy as well. So there's a lot of, um, you know, the reality is that it's, it is data protection. And it is almost, you know, the way, practically speaking, um, the way many CISOs will approach privacy is privacy is really all about just protecting a form of data that has a specific compliance requirement tied to it, plus availability. So it's, you know, as, as I said, it, it's just, practically speaking, very hard to, to sort of extricate the two. And so I would say, interestingly, um, we're, I think we're pretty okay when it comes to the protection of data. The challenge that we have is, again, it's a practical one in so much as we don't know where the data is. Sure, the right of privacy, you have to know that it is actually there. And so <laughs> I think, you know, it's a, it's a very practical problem that we have. And, you know, so for instance, we are um, right now working, we've got a solution out in the market right now. We allow um, consumers to request, you know, pursuant to the California, um, you know, Pri Privacy Protection Act or GDPR to understand what kind of data is being maintained or held by a corporation. And so what we've done is we've deployed the solution where you can make that request, goes into a workflow, what we do is we run a bunch of bots to figure out what data is out there about you. Then we stage that data and we're able to express to the end user what data we have. Now that is informing from a security perspective what needs to be protected. So it's a kind of a, a reverse, so you know, to your point is, is privacy going to be able to inform security? I think it is a, it's a, it's a circle. And I think Privacy is enabling us to find the data that needs to be protected, 
the question for the corporation is going to be, how much money do I want to spend to actually protect it? Do I care? Yeah, and what's the impact going to be if I don't? Yeah, those are Google questions. Yeah. Um, so, um, Billy, anything to add? When Kristen mentioned GDPR earlier, uh, she touched on something I think plays heavily into this question of privacy and security. She talked about how um, individuals are considered to, to own their own identity and the information about their identity, which is what they would want to protect through privacy. And they'll use security techniques and tools to protect it. Um, what we're seeing in trends with zero trust environments where you know who the actor is, whether it's a component or a device or an actual individual within your environment, understanding that identity is critical. And for me, what becomes really interesting when we talk about both privacy and security is who's in charge of issuing that identity. If the identity comes from the state, like in the United States model, where you're given a social security number by the state, and that essentially allows you to have an identity, a legitimate identity in our country. Well, it's like you're given a unique serialized number, right? And that number is an identity. In your systems, where I'm going with this is, I'm really curious about how we really get um, individuals in the future to be the ones who decide when to share that number. They're, they ought to be the ones to own it and recognize there's value in it. Today, people, um, I don't think they fully realize how valuable their personal information is. So every time they, they accept an application and they fail to read all the terms and conditions in that fine print, and they say, sure, I'll offer up my location, my identity, my email address, maybe my telephone number, maybe my, the color of my hair, maybe even keystrokes of what I'm writing to my husband or my children or to my doctor. They're, they're giving up their privacy willingly. And what we've done is we've, allowed, we've once again given it away. As American citizens, what we've done is we've said, I'm, I'm okay with um, allowing a another third party corporate organization to own my identity and trade it and make money off of it as long as I get that free good or service in return. When people stop thinking about that being a commodity that they want to give away when they recognize how valuable it is, then I think we're going to see a shift in the technology where we will put the control back, align it more closely to the individual, make people really aware of how valuable it is, and give them the opportunity to decide in very discreet ways when they're willing to give it up. The European model of GDPR does that by really identifying who a data owner is, who the, the, the proxy is, who has authority to use privacy information. We're not there that yet in the United States. We have a lot to learn there, but the technology is not really fine tuned enough yet to allow people in an environment to decide when they want to give it up. It, it's just too cumbersome. All that legalese, it, it's never going to work when corporations are allowed to trade um, some commodity for it. Yeah, right. and, but I, but, and I think just to add on to that, you know, we just did a study on the consumer perception of uh, privacy and trust. And what we, what, you know, based on our research, what we found is that yes, indeed, 60% of consumers will give away their personally identifiable information for coupon. It's just, mm -hmm. it's a fact. And businesses understand that. They understand that they're able to commoditize and monetize that data um, if they were to, get, if, to give you a benefit. You know, consumers will say, it's okay for you to have my data. And frankly, I, I want to give you my data if I'm going to get this benefit. The only thing I ask in return is control, is some ability to control that, th that data and to understand when you're using it and how you're using it. So I think what's happening, you know, within the marketplace is, you know, again, you asked a question about sort of this balkanization. We were talking about some of the compliance patterns. You know, this, the security controls that we implement to enable or to assure the right of privacy is kind of, again, it's a manifestation of the culture and, and society's wills and beliefs and wants around these issues like privacy. And as Julian's pointing out, until we get to a point where the consumers really care and are really demanding trusted systems, it's gonna be hard for the business 
to really drive a lot of that protection because the, the person, the human being who's meant to sort of derive benefit doesn't care that much. It's unfortunate, but it's true. There, I'm going to try to synthesize something both of you said that, that you made me think of as you were talking. Um, as a faculty member, if I do research with human subjects, uh, there are certain things that I'm bound by. And the underlying principles, one is the idea of informed consent. And a lot of the information right now, uh, we don't inform users and we don't get their consent really because they mm -hmm. don't know what it is they're consenting to. Um, a second is the idea of autonomy, of respecting their autonomy, their ability to opt out, uh, their respecting their individual rights. And that varies from locale to locale. And the last is the idea of beneficence, which is if we're going to take their information, we should give them something of benefit in return. And again, that's viewed differently in different uh, uh, commercial and political domains. Uh, so th there are some underlying principles that we're going to have to consider both for privacy and for security. And, and really what are the values that we're trying to support? That's likely to be more difficult than the technology uh, which is often the case, right? And that, that's, but that's the, both the beauty and the challenge of, of trying to sort of move up the security ladder is exactly that, is it's not necessarily a technology challenge. It's a challenge of how do you ensure that the controls that you are implementing are reflective of the values and the outcomes you're trying to achieve. Right, right, right. right. Yes. Yeah. It's become almost cliche to say that data is, um, is a natural resource, um, but people don't think of their personal data being an asset or a natural resource. Until they do, they, don't, they won't treat it like currency. They give it away. And mm -hmm. until we have that mind shift and people believe that they own their own identity and it has value, then they'll use security techniques to really protect their privacy. Um, and we'll see the technology adapt to match that. And Kristen made that point beautifully. So it's not a technology problem. It's just that people don't, don't value it yet. Great. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift this a little bit. Um, you've both been in the field for a while at, at uh, functioning at high levels and you've seen as the field has changed. And one of the things that's happened for largely for marketing reasons has been uh, fads, right? So I, I would say that everybody jumped on cloud, everybody jumped on threat intelligence and, and big data. Uh, then uh, I'm not really sure quite the order, but uh, blockchain has been a big deal. Um, frankly, my personal view is, is there's a lot of interesting research there, but very little useful application. Um, quantum and AI. Uh, AI seems to be a really big deal now. Um, these, these fads tend to push companies into marketing certain kinds of products. Uh, we see a proliferation of these on the market without any real metrics to know how well they work. Uh, as someone noted in the Slack, the average CISO in a large company needs to manage over 80 cyber projects, uh, products to help defend their systems and data. And these, these kind of fads don't really help us. So. <laughs> Um, what do you see as a solution for people managing the technology in the face of this kind of need to continually have new fads in the technology um, where we neglect some of the basics along the way? Uh, how, how do you deal with this? Okay, let me just start with just the market dynamics because I think it's important to understand why they use the 80 tools. Again, go back to the, why do people, what is the buying occasion for buying a tool? I buy a security tool because of one of two reasons. There's a compliance requirement out there that says I have to you know, meet some sort of requirement. Or B, I've got a crisis. I'm bleeding from the eyes and I've got to fix the problem. So typically speaking, organizations buy the cheapest possible tool that they can to solve the problem. I've seen this again and again and again. And so over time, what happens is you get this tapestry of technologies that have not been strategically acquired. They've been cobbled together to solve these siloed and discrete problems. Meanwhile, you've got a market, a very, very hot venture market, lots of money in the marketplace today. 
there are, uh, the last statistics I saw, there are about 8,000 vendors in the security community, 98% of which are doing less than $5 million of revenue. Okay, so if you think about that, what that means is, and oh, by the way, these guys are raising money at unbelievable clip rates in order for them to get their voice out, right, to find a buyer that's going to buy their product, they have to spend it on marketing. And so, you know, stuff, as you're, as you're pointing out, everybody picks onto the latest, greatest it's AI, it's quantum, it's whatever, that, that it's the marketing buzzword. And, and the reason is because you just want to sell your thing. So I, I would say that if you're a CISO, if you want to sort of be successful, you have to, again, go back to the COVID, the, the sort of silver line in the COVID cloud, stream, streamlining, simplifying, integrating, orchestrating your processes, this is key. You have to think about it strategically. You have to think about it from a security by design philosophy, because if you're only buying for compliance or crisis reasons, it is going to be inevitable that you're going to end up with those 80, you know, technology buckets. Right. <clears throat> Any, anything from sort of a government perspective on this? Uh, I, well, you know, I, I'm living this. There are hundreds of products and we're pitched every day by industry counterparts who are talking about the latest AI, blockchain, IoT, you name it. Um, they're even uh, homomorphic encryption and you, it, it goes on and on and on. Um, right. But it, it's compelling. We, we have a job to do to stay abreast of that technology because there really are innovations. I, I think, for example, with AI in particular, Think about the generations of, of SIM systems that we've seen where over time we've learned how to instrument an enterprise to get a dashboard view and then how to do analytics and make sense of that enterprise. And, and the problem with that has been not just getting the instrument, instrumentation in place and making sense of your dashboard, but the, f the fact that it's been very rules-based and um, the rules come from the things we know, all the mistakes we've already made, all the known risks that exist, all the attack vectors that are known and understood. But artificial intelligence gives us a chance to, to say, it's possible we could anticipate or notice anomalies, maybe understand patterns enough to even anticipate what comes next, and to also then begin to automate with playbooks and begin to have more rapid responses for volumes of information that are just, just overwhelming for human beings. So I, I think there's real promise in some of the technology. I don't wanna dismiss it as all gimmicky or, or hollow, but I completely agree that at this point, if, if a company doesn't have artificial intelligence on its website, it, it's, it's almost like considered irrelevant because everybody has to have it nowadays. Um, it, and it isn't even differentiating anymore. And yet artificial intelligence doesn't even exist yet, right? It's really <laughs> machine learning applications. Let's be honest, it's advanced analytics that are being put into practice. So um, it's a really funny time where, where we are um, seeing that, that low level, small companies being really innovative, but by, their, by definition for them to be successful, they have to be very fit to purpose. And so they're addressing very specific problems. They're not helping the CIO with enterprise-wide solutions. Then I have to turn to a big company with a big bulky solution that's heavyweight, extremely expensive, typically cloud-based, which doesn't, doesn't account for my compute cost or my storage cost. I gotta maintain all those logs. I have to decide how long to maintain the logs. And then when I make that decision, the adversary just has to look and say, oh, well, if she's saving logs for a year, I'll wait a year and a half and then I'll attack. Um, so no matter what we do, we're playing whack-a-mole with the risk. So it's a pretty depressing situation to be honest. Okay, so what do I think the, <laughs> the answer is? Um, it, we've talked a lot about soft skills and maybe it's, it's uh, this is thematic because Kristen and I both sort of came from academic roots that were in the humanities and I think we're both left brain, right brain people. For me, um, it, it has, I have to rely on the people and also the relationships and the processes that the relationships have built out in our organization to keep us safe. I have to be thinking about for the whole of the enterprise, do we have the right people in place at the right levels? 
not just to look and address those uh, very small individual risks and system specific risks, but also the right executives in place to understand how do we get our arms around the whole thing and how do we surface the conversations about the macro risks and trends and patterns that we're seeing over time at the right time. And you have to make time and space have the right governance forms to have those conversations. So as a government person, this may sound kind of wonky or bureaucratic, but for me, really understanding how to um, operate within my bureaucracy, have build those friendships and relationships with my counterparts and security and counterintelligence, again, kind of the, the, the mainstays, also the mission leaders, the people who own the mission objective, in my case, it's human intelligence or analysis, and also the technology providers and bring, in, bring them together to really have those deep conversations about what we're seeing at macro trends. Great. Well, I, I think part of the problem that I've seen, at least from my point of view, we don't have any really good metrics for security. In fact, we really don't even have a good definition of what security is. Uh, and that hurts because coming up with good exact metrics are very difficult to measure. And then to take all these products and approaches and uh, you know, whether, whether we're uh, doing a waterfall model or whether we're, we're doing uh, um, some other kind of quick, quick approach to uh, dynamic programming or uh, AI development or whatever it is we're doing, we don't have the metrics to really measure quality. Um, I remember having a conversation 20 years ago with Harlan Mills and, and he said part of the problem is that as a field, uh, we're at the point where civil engineering was before they'd invented the right triangle. Uh, mm -hmm. it, we're such a young field, we don't really know the qualities yet, and we're evolving very rapidly. As you said, we're, we're drawing from past experience and these relationships. We do a lot by analogy rather than defining our own terms. So I'm curious as to what each of you sees as useful ways of measuring the value or the impact of things that you may apply or new products or changes in methodologies. Are there a set of metrics that you turn to? Or, or is it pretty much just based on, on best evaluation of experience? Yeah, I, I can, you know, so we do a lot of work today with clients in defining, um, you know, approaches to financially quantifying risk. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, where this all comes um, is to the management team, to the C-suite and to the board. And what they're all asking is, what am I getting? What, what is the return on my investment? Am I good enough? Meaning if I'm spending money on security, is it getting me to where I need to be or not? And so when you're thinking about, well, how do you translate that, you know, from technology into sort of business speak. I think one of the challenges that we do have is ordinarily we do turn to metrics that are very technical, like patch levels. You know, but that doesn't necessarily correlate to what is the business value that you're trying to sort of achieve. And so the approach that, you know, I, I've always taken personally is to think about it more in a business context. So if you think about a business, a business is really nothing more than a set of processes. And those processes like order to cash is, is, a, is a process. So if you think about that process, that process in includes people and includes technologies and it's got policies and it's a defined workflow. So that's a business process that can be measured and you can look at the, the pieces of it. So if you think about it as a whole and you say, okay, now if that process goes down, what is the impact going to be to the business? It's going to be put me out of business to I don't really care. So there is a financial sort of metric that you can put on that business process. Now, if you think about the individual components of that process, you can begin to measure, gee, what's the security risk associated with this business process? Um, meaning what could possibly happen that's gonna impact the process and make it go down? How do I begin to measure the effectiveness of controls in and around those component parts? And from that, you can begin to derive a business oriented metric that allows you to translate sort of those individual piece parts like patch levels, and then again, correlate that into sort of a bigger, you know, what is the, how is the effort that I'm putting into things like patch management, how is it helping me to protect this business process, which is ultimately core to the business itself? 
and then see the metric at that level. So it's really part of the business impact analysis process by which you're applying the cybersecurity metrics to derive the outcome. Okay. Um, well, let me let me ask a sort of a follow up. What do you each think about the NIST cybersecurity framework? Do you, if you have an opinion that you want to state, I, I I spend a lot of time with the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, and I'm sure Kristen does too. Yeah. So um, it it's helpful in the sense that it it provides sort of this canonical framework and a way to think about enterprise risk, but really, I think it's much more relevant for assessing system risk. It, it, in, in my opinion, it's not, it, it's really up to the enterprise leaders to decide how they're going to manage risk within their organization. And there's no uh, guide within NIST to help us with that. That's part, it's going to be a manifestation of our culture and how we decide to work with one another at the enterprise level when we decide to accept risks. For, um, for individual systems being an authorizing official under the NIST framework, I find that it's, it's useful because it gives us a common language. It gives us the, the common controls with definitions so that security assessors can look and see if a particular system either meets a control or not and it helps me have a common language to have these risk conversations. So that's useful, but I'll tell you, um, we do hundreds if not thousands of authorizations every year from my, you know, under my pen. And um, it's a little bit like whack-a-mole. Um, I can spend my entire day in looking at the trees, to use that analogy of losing the forest for the trees, because I'll take each system as it comes, use these security controls, assess a system, decide whether a system's authorized to operate or not, give it a blessing, and then the next day there's 100 more, or 10 more, or five more, or 50 more. And it, three days later, I've essentially forgotten what risks I've accepted on behalf of my director and to my agency. And the problem is, there's really no good mechanism with NIST to roll that up and really know over time whether that de whether that risk has increased, mm -hmm. decreased. If I need to go back and look at it, it's just a point in time for one particular system, and so it's inadequate to the task to really understand enterprise risk. Yeah, uh, that gets to my earlier question about good metrics. Uh, mm -hmm. We really have a lack there. It might be interesting. I don't know if you've had a conversation with Ron Ross, um, but uh, you know this might be a great follow up with him or some of the other people there at NIST about next steps that they ought to look at. I would welcome that conversation. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's, he's really great. We've had him speak here at the symposium before and uh, um, I, I, he's very open to these kinds of things. Well, uh, I'm gonna ask you sort of a trite question, but, but uh, the answers are always illuminating. Is there some something that sort of keeps each of you up at night that it is a looming risk or something that um, you think is coming that, that you're not quite sure how to handle? And Are you talking about not, cybersecurity or being a, a working mother? Yeah, I was gonna say, I think each of us can. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> so our, our daughters actually, like, they live together um, in D.C., and there was a shooting on their block um, last week. And so Julianne and I have both been texting furiously back and forth. And that's one category of problems. Don't sit in front of the window, honey. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I tell them, when you hear the gunshots, just duck, stay low, take yeah, cover. Yeah. yeah, get under a table. Um, well, I, I'm... I, Yes, but let's let's sort of <laughs> more on this. Take me back to cybersecurity. <laughs> um, I I can say, and I'm sure what Julianne says is going to be far more interesting than what I say. So I'll just go very quickly and say, I am um, I, I am particularly concerned just about social activism. I mean, we're seeing a lot more um, you sort of cybersecurity attacks, particularly a ransomware attacks. Um, being executed for other than financial gain. 
and that can be very dangerous. Um, I think you know what we're seeing is there are people that are just trying to make a point. And when you're using disruptive tactics to make a point in kind of a very anonymized way, um, it's significant. We're seeing, you know, it used to be, you know, years back, it was a fraction of 1% of attacks had uh, sort of a disruptive kind of focus. We're seeing a significant increase in the proportion of attacks that are disruptive and the end motivation not being financial gain, but being making, you know, sort of making that point. And, um, you know, that, that's very hard um, because, because going back to risk, and, and I do want to take a step back, so forgive me, just take one more minute. The, we haven't really talked enough about risk. Risk is such a critical question here. Security is a process. Managing security is a process, and it's about managing risk. And risk is identified by identifying the threat, the bad guys, identifying the vulnerability, what they're targeting, and understanding the impact. And then defining what kind of controls do I want to put in place to decrease the likelihood that that threat can get in, to decrease the number of vulnerabilities that can be exploited, or to decrease the impact. And you know, again, going back to what keeps me up at night, the threats and their motivations are much different. The tactics that they're using and the kinds of malware, forms of malware they're using can create such an impact. It's very hard for us to you know, sort of recognize what, what, what's gonna happen long-term and so, you know, if you ask me what's keeping me up at night, that's what's keeping me up at night. That and disinformation, but I'll let my sister talk about that one. Okay. So you ask what, what keeps me up at night, um, other than being a mom and thinking about your kids. Um, so this, this has a huge dynamic range to the question. Um, and, and I will tell you, I, I think generally speaking, the job is so engrossing that I come home at night and I'm just dog tired and so nothing actually keeps me up at night. And I'll, and I'll say culturally, it's very nice to be part of an organization that has a bias for action and hires really competent people. And so I generally don't worry so much as spend that very busy day working with really competent people to address the things we know are risks. But the range of the risks, my goodness, um, sometimes it's something as stupid as a privileged user who's a knucklehead who uses password as his password. Um, you know, that, that frightens me. Uh, sometimes as much as reading a, a very uh, eye-watering report about a patient, well-funded nation state actor who is operating um, to undermine our democracy. And you can know them by name and it is absolutely chilling. Th there's a huge dynamic range there. And you might say, well, they're both worth staying up at night and worrying or, or, or doing something about. But actually, because we have good people, I don't worry so much about those things because I put them both in the same category as the risks I know about. Those are things that we already know exist. And so if you know it's there, you can start organizing, marshalling your resources to address it. The things that really um, make me feel more unsettled is the fact that there's a lot more that I don't know. And I, I get concerned that there could be something, the next intelligence failure, the next uh, big insider threat is already in my enterprise and I haven't detected it yet or I don't know about it yet. Um, it's, we all made fun of Don Rumsfeld. This is another thing that's going to date me, but we, we made fun of him when he called the, the scariest things, the unknown unknowns, but really it's, it's unknown risks that have unknown mitigations. I, those are the things that, that make, make me feel unsettled. And, and I think that's a matter of maturity in the field. Um, I, I know several younger people, people without a lot of experience who, sort of think that they have a handle on all the possible vulnerabilities, uh, which just shows they, they don't have a long enough view, a deep enough understanding of the systems. Uh, which brings me to the next question I have here. And, and I'll pause for a moment and say, there are some great comments coming in on the Slack channel. I've tried to extract a few of those to turn into questions. But if, if you, either of you or both of you are available after this talk for a little while, to maybe comment on some of those in the Slack channel, that would be great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not gonna get to all of those. Uh, there, there are just so many interesting things that 
you two can comment on here. Um, one that I'd like to turn around for our audience, particularly our students, you talk to, and, and it's related to my last comment, you talk to a lot of people um, in the field, some are new, some are looking to get into the field. Um, what do you see as some factors that you really wish they knew more about or that uh, they didn't believe they knew as much about, so, some things that you wish they had a better understanding of to do well in these kinds of positions. So this, this could be phrased as advice to our students. Uh, what should they spend more time learning or unlearning? So wherever you want to start with that or go with that. Chris, do you want to start? You want me to take it? You start, I'll, I'll follow. Um, it, it's a great question. Um, I, I guess it's, my take on it is I would really encourage every student to try to set aside his or her insecurities about what they don't know and be growth minded and be willing to put their hands on the keyboard and try things. I, it's just been remarkable to me to see how quickly the technology landscape has changed in my, in my personal career and, and, and how we, just within, I won't say how long it has been, but um, just, just let's take a 10 year period, how, how quickly the whole landscape shifts. 10 years ago, people weren't really, cloud was an idea, it was jargon, cloud is real. Um, and, that, and that's just, it's, and it's completely commonplace. And so in order to succeed and thrive, I would ask cybersecurity professionals to just be growth minded and voracious in their learning, be always willing to, to try it and, and, and put their hands on, again, put their hands on the keyboard, experiment and learn. And I also think there's nothing beyond, um, I shouldn't say nothing, but the average intellect is good enough. If you're still, if that C that you got in some math class in high school is haunting you, you need to, you need to just put it out of your mind because in our world today, there are enough tools and um, it's a team sport essentially to work in any enterprise. There are going to be people around you who want you to succeed and they want you to learn. If you show the interest and the curiosity, there will be someone who can show you how. It's, it's, not, like, um, it's not like all the academic experiences you may have had as a kid coming up through the system. That's great, that's great. And I'd say the only thing I would add, because I think it's a great answer, you know, is it is relatively easy to find a job in, in the security field. What's harder is to progress your career in security. And so, you know, I think you should always be, you know, that voracious learning is incredibly important, but it's also recognizing coming back to those soft skills. You know, success in security is about convincing people to do things they don't want to do. And it is, it's hard, it's hard. And security folks get a bad name for, you know, being the anchor around the neck. And you have to learn, you know, sort of those, sort of the softer skills of being able to collaborate, to arbitrate, to creatively, um, you know, sort of uh, think about solutions because there is no insecurity. There's lots of ways to get to an answer. You have to be willing to, kind of iterate through those answers to find the one that is going to be affordable and the most acceptable to the business and then to be able to communicate that in a way that you know the listener can understand and adopt and, and, and do so effectively. So you know how you do that, you know, it's just it's, it's just working with people. It's 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 learning how to communicate with people. It's it's learning how to use PowerPoint and things of that nature. But this is this is really key that interpersonal relationship. I think both of you have touched on the fact that communications and communication skills are really important. Uh, being able to talk to each other, being able to talk to management, um, and and so I'll, I'll stress that because that's something I regularly hear as well. Um, the, the people who are more focused on learning how to program and less on how to talk to others are really missing out on their futures. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had one, I had one other question here that somebody had suggested that <clears throat> is, is, is a, little bit, a little bit to the side of this, but um, so, so Julie, and, and what you have been doing um, 
there is the risk to human safety if some of the information is compromised or some of the system is compromised. People can actually die in some circumstances. And I, I'm not going to go to any specifics and not asking you to either. But as a national intelligence agency working in, in an important area, this is a, a concern. We're beginning to see in the commercial play, marketplace now where systems being hacked can also result in dangers to human safety. And we're seeing some of that um, attacks on utilities. The recent uh, ransomware outbreak in Germany that caused the death of a patient from being transferred. Uh, Self-driving automobiles with mm -hmm. adversarial AI uh, teaching that can result in accidents. And so we're increasingly now looking at, to use an older term, safety as being integral with security, that we mm -hmm. need to use that as well. And uh, do you see that trend or that change having any good impact on what we do with security or is it making our jobs more complicated? I'll give you a practical example. Um, so we were working at an incident and I, and I can't use names obviously, but it was a, uh, a, a children's hospital. And in this children's hospital, they have a bunch of, uh, I think it was like Samsung television sets. And they had developed an application to enable the families to go and find out what was in the cafeteria for lunch. Um, and what happened is there was malware that was sort of integrated within the application. The application was updated, loaded onto the television sets. Television sets were, um, they were on a flat network. So they started, uh, it was a, denial of service stack essentially, I won't get into too many of the details, but took the, took the hospital down. You know, it, it's impossible to know whether or not there were any, you know, sort of health and safety impacts on the, uh, on the children in that hospital, but you can imagine, you know, it was not only making them really unhappy because they had to take televisions offline for like two days while they were updating them, but, you know, there was an impact on the, the, the hospital itself and the hospital operations. So this happens. It happens regularly. Um, I do think that there is a growing awareness of the potential sort of safety impacts associated with the subversion of these um, types of technologies, even as something as simple as, as a television set. I do think because there is a safety element to it, you know, yes, it's adding complexity because it's a different form of attack vector with a different form of impact. When you're just talking about data, it's kind of easier to get your arms around. When you're thinking about it this way, it's, I mean, the, the potpourri of bad stuff that can happen is just unbelievable. But the benefit is it's getting people's, um, particularly at the C-suite, it's getting them to think about it. Um, and so we're seeing a lot more interest from the C-suite in understanding what the potential liability and impact to consumers and employees could be for the failure to protect these kinds of systems, particularly IoT devices. Okay, well, so Julie, you've lived in an environment where there's been awareness of this for quite some time about the safety issues, and that helps drive some of the decisions. What do you see from your perspective about the change in the, in the market and the, in the deployments? Well, there, well, there are a couple of things. Uh, there have been other heavily regulated industries where people recognize cybersecurity is integral to their success. So the banking finance industry, for example, where it may not uh, cause loss of life, but the impact to bottom line and the threat to business um, has encouraged that, um, that industry to adopt cybersecurity practices that have been in national security for a long time. Encryption is a really good example. And um, I, I see good cross-pollinization. So on the good side, I think this could mean that as other agencies recognize that there are significant existential threats, if safety is impugned because their cybersecurity practices are poor, they'll make bigger investments. That will mean we could have more people working in the cybersecurity industry. We might get different innovations because let's say in oil and gas, for example, somebody thinks of a new way to do something for an offshore platform that might help me with my expeditionary and technical communications and ways to do things in a remote, remote, austere, disconnected environment. I could learn from that and I would hope that those cybersecurity professionals can enrich my environment as well. So I think there's opportunities for the, the level of play among all cybersecurity professionals to improve as a result. Um, similarly, 
you take self-driving cars, just another tactical example, where I think um, remote operations that we've seen in national security, things like um, UAVs and UAS, these um, unmanned aerial systems, those, uh, that kind of technology has been secured for national security. I assume that there's probably directly relevant technology and approaches for the, the automobile industry. And those professionals are, are moving back and forth between the, the industries. So I'm gonna try and be positive here and say like, I think it, it's a good thing for, our, for people and their careers in this field. Um, I, I hope I, I can also learn from those industries directly in enterprise risk management approaches because back to some of our earlier conversations, I think that's the biggest challenge from where I sit today. It's really getting our arms around the whole of the enterprise. And I hope that other industry executives and adjacent industries will, maybe they'll solve it before I do. Oh, that's great. Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. and. Um... As I said, we have some things on the Slack channel, so maybe when we're done, if you, if either of you can spend a little time on that as available, that would be great. But to tie this up, um, I've asked on a number of things. Is there anything you wish I had asked or something that you want to say to the audience here um, to close out? So, Julie, why don't you start? Well, I'm saying I would like to offer that um, again. I want to thank Purdue University and Sirius, and to the audience listening here. You've taken time from your day to spend time with Kristen and me and Spaff, and I really appreciate it. And we're looking for really good men and women to join our team at the CIA. If you're a cybersecurity professional and you have skills and you're, you've got game and you care about national security, check us out. CIA.gov. Everybody applies the same way, so you can find all the jobs listed there. Come take a look. I've had some of my students work there and they've enjoyed the experience. So great. great. And my sister's awesome, by the way. So best boss in the world. Um, but I, uh, I, I'd like to say the same thing. And Spock, thank you so much for having us. Sirius, Purdue University, thank you for hosting us. It's been incredibly enjoyable. Um, EY is also a great place to work, by the way. So uh, if you're interested, go to, I think our contact information is being shared, um, but you can always find uh, me in particular on LinkedIn. Feel free to LinkedIn me. And if you'd like some um, you know, pointers to who to speak to in EY from a recruitment perspective, please let us know as well. Um, we're always, 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 always actively recruiting. And so again, thank you so much. Well, thank you both. I, I think it's wonderful to uh, gain perspective from people who deal with large problem sets over time, uh, because you can bring something to this that we can't easily offer in a classroom. And, and that's that perspective. Um, I would encourage those listening, particularly the students, to uh, reflect on some of this and think about some of the larger challenges that you're going to be facing. If you have some questions that weren't answered, uh, please go to the Slack channel and please enjoy the remainder of the symposium. We've got some other exciting things coming up uh, and thank you all for your participation.